Okay, Einstein says, the more famous I get, the more stupid I get, because back when I was 20 and 18 and I worked in some clerk's office, I could spend all my leisure time thinking about time and space and relativity, and I was just concentrating, and now everybody's praising me for how brilliant I am, and I hardly spend any time thinking, <laughs> which happens a lot. But he's, you know, very honest, and he, I think you would like those little essays if you ever have time. Um, all right, so let's see, Colin, did you have, did you put something on the chat? Jordan put her two bits on the chat. Um, um, who else? Tim, did you have a reaction for today? Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, I didn't have a reaction, but like I had, I was just so confused today. Like, what? I didn't. Where was the pre-class video? I I I sent it late. Oh, that's why. I sent it. I think this afternoon, and it was this only afternoon. fifteen minutes. But you were supposed to read the material, so. Um. What is the topic about? I could talk about that line of another topic. Well, why don't you listen to some other people and then I'll um I'll lecture a little bit and then you can respond. Okay. Is that okay. Okay. Okay, Alyssa, what have you got? Um for me, when I was reading about the five pillars of Islam, you know, prayer, uh I forgot all the others. <laughs> There's a scene and everything. It made me uh, think of like the sacraments within like Christian church. Yeah. And I thought again, like, oh, that's another correlation that a lot of people don't even realize we have to how similar our two religions can be. Well, and then it, to me, if you go back to Aristotle's virtues and you go back to the human condition, that explains it. Okay. Because it's, uh, prayer. So there is this view that the universe is greater than we are, and we need to see our place within it. Every religion has that. And then there's um, uh, giving of alms, generosity. And Aristotle says that's a very important virtue because we do all depend on each other, and we do have to put our money where the, our mouth is because that develops trust between citizens and goodwill. People know that they have each other's backs, that they care about each other, and they're willing to put some money into it. So generosity. And then the third one is fasting, which of course is self-control in relation to eating. And then they don't drink, no alcohol. And so that's temperance, right? Um, and then there's the, uh, pilgrimage to Mecca. And that's, again, it, it really internationalizes. It bonds people with other Muslims all over the world. Um, and then what's the fourth one? Anyway, yeah, they are. Does that make sense, Alyssa? That there's a reason why they're so similar. Yes, that makes sense. Okay, so Okay, so why don't I start with, I'll talk about Indonesia. My experience there was so amazing, which is why I'm going to go back. Um, hopefully, I'm, I'm going to try to, um, sorry, I'm going to try to work on some articles. I've written a number of articles. A friend of mine started a journal a few years ago. And also I write for an international journal just to let the world know about Indonesia and its interfaith, predominantly Muslim, the most Muslims in the world, the vast majority are committed to uniting democracy and Islam. They have their Panchasila. Um, all right, so, um, well, let me start with this one. Um, my just, you know, this is the presentation I gave when I went out 
to churches and stuff after I got home. Um, nurturing democracy. So my claim is that it's very important to Westerners, Americans, that Indonesia remain democratic, because if it turns, if it gives in to Islamicism, if it becomes an Islamic state, 260 million people and 12 million are not Muslims, and it could really bring in a civil war, a lot of strife. I can't even imagine what would happen, but it's important, right? It's for us to understand them, to support them, whatever. So this is Indonesia. It's, I, you know, I knew nothing about it. And uh, I, you know, I started learning stuff on the airplane on the way over there. It was totally ridiculous, but it, there's the Philippines and there's China and the uh, Indo um, Thailand, Vietnam, Indochina. And so it's down here and it has 17,000 islands. Um, Minnesota has supposedly 10,000 lakes. And the joke is that when it rains, because some of the lakes are so small that they probably don't exist now in a drought. But I say Indonesia has 17,000 islands when it doesn't rain or now that climate change is happening, they are literally losing islands. So no Indonesian denies climate change. You know, you can be in the backward, most backward village anywhere, and there's no way you're going to get any traction out of denying climate change because everybody is living with it. Um, okay, so I was assigned to uh, a guy named Tajul and Arifin, he was my mentor, he normally taught the class. So the class that I taught was Western thought, and I taught it at an Islamic State University. So in 1998, um, uh, before that, every Indonesian uh, child was tracked either in an Islamic track for their education or a secular track. Um, out of 260 million, 12 million are non-Muslims. Oh, and why are they? Okay, so Indonesia was always exploited for their natural resources. So there are a certain number of Confucians because the Chinese came to get their stuff. And there are a certain number of Buddhists and, Hindu, and Hindus because they came from India to come get their stuff. And then they're the Muslims who came from the Middle East to get their stuff. And then there are the Protestants, the Dutch. This was called the Spice Islands. So the Dutch came and got their spices and other stuff. And then the Portuguese came and got slaves, right? They got human resources. So Indonesia has been exploited for resources, but now it has this sort of multi-faith culture as a result. All right. So um uh so the indonesian government said to the islamic universities there were five of them i think that we will give you money we will give you government money but you must teach world religions western thought feminism and i think environmentalism there were things you must have in your curriculum and so the result is every college educated uh, Indonesian, right, secular or uh, Muslim, is educated in Western thought and world religions. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine if every single American who went to college had to take world religions and Chinese thought or something like that, right? There would be this huge, I mean, that would trickle down and that was trying to get rid of religious bigotry and trying to get rid of being isolated and trying to make the whole population much more tolerant and much more humanistic. Um, and then it could they could be Hindu humanist, Buddhist humanist, Muslim. I mean, it doesn't matter, but you'd focus on humanism. And that's why they liked it when I came there. They, they liked my work and they kept wanting me to come back. So. Um, you know, I really like coming there and, 
and it's fun. But anyway, so Ranti, Tajul had a niece uh, named Ranti, and um, her husband worked on an Exxon oil rig, so he was gone most of the time. So Tajul uh, hired her, asked her to come and live with me. He rented a house and she took care of me and she would translate and she would get these modems for my computer. You know, there's lots of stuff you need and, and whatever juice for my phone. It wasn't all online or wireless at the time. And um, she also came with me to my lectures and um, then she did my, she cleaned the house, she fed me, she cooked for me, and she um, gave, gave, uh, let's see, she, she ironed, she did my laundry and she ironed my underwear. And I told her, you don't have to iron my underwear. And then every night she gave me a foot massage. And I'll tell you guys, that's why they cost a lot of money. I understand. I could, every night I go to bed, geez, I could use a foot massage. But this slide is about her grandma. She, her mom died in childbirth and her stepmom didn't want her living in their house. So she was raised by her grandma. And this is an example of that, how to think about healthcare. Like we supposedly have the best healthcare system anywhere, except that it costs three times more than it costs in Europe. And our life span is no different. And then in Indonesia, they have inferior healthcare. No question. But the grandma is just sitting in the living room of her daughter and she's just gonna die someday, right? And I'm just thinking, is that so bad? Is that so bad? that she's not in a nursing home and far away from family and being taken care of by people she doesn't know. So I do think we should reconsider some of our stuff. Um, this is, here's Tajul and there's the name of the school. This is Panchasila, their Declaration of Independence. There are five principles, belief in God, interfaith, a just and civilized humanity, which means politics plays an important role. So there's an expectation of public education, an expectation of public transportation, an expectation of public health care. And, and most developing countries have that. China has that. We are way out there in our pro-capitalist, minimal government uh, model. We're just, we're by far the farthest out. Um, and then Indonesian unity, which means bringing people from the different islands, and the different um, religions together for various events, trying to weave people together. And then when you're making particular decisions, if you remember the art of deliberation is when you have to make a decision in a particular situation. And this is straight out of Aristotle also, as the goal is wisdom. It isn't just knowledge, it's wisdom and deliberation. And then it's not a strict democracy, it's representational. So you elect a representative and they come and they, their aim is wisdom and they talk to each other. They get there by deliberating. And then justice for all means you have these institutional structures. Um, the political context was, um, oh boy, 1945 and then Sukarno and then Suhardo. I, I'm not going to spend all this time on it, but the main punchline is that they've had extremist Marxists, communists, and they've had extremist Islamists, and the vast majority want something in between, and they want it to be pluralistic and democratic. So I taught all these Western thinkers, and I have my own method of teaching where I dress up like the person and I pretend that I'm that person, and I try to convince the students to agree with me. And it was really funny because they would agree with me, you know? And then, cause I love to do this. I used to be in theater and anyway, and then the next week I would say, you know, that person you heard last week, he's totally wrong. Like, this is the truth. And so after about three or four weeks, they'd come up to me and say, well, Dr. Beck, 
I don't agree with any of them completely. And then I said, ah, you're thinking. Ah, that's it. You're thinking. And, you know, it hadn't dawned on them that that was the starting point for what I was looking for. That wasn't a bad thing or confusing. That was like the beginning of developing your own worldview, of living an examined life, of being fair to opposing points of view, of being able to bring these views together and come to a new synthesis. Anyway, and when I taught it that way, like Tajul had taught it for years, but he just said, okay, Bacon thinks this, and then, you know, Locke thinks this with no, no idea that someone might actually believe it. It's just a bunch of facts. And then when I taught it, he said, oh, there's something like that in Islam. And it's like, yeah, I think so. <laughs> because Islam tries to account for all these, these partial truths. And then I talked about the classical virtues and the students, you know, they get it. They get it. They understand this. Um, and then the political virtues, living together under a rule of law. And I talk about that. Then I talked about the Greek myths. They, they were interested in that. I'll give you one story that I, there was a feminist Muslim professor at the school and um, her class came and listened to my lecture. And um, so she was in the audience and Tajul said, oh yeah, Zeus, um, I said that the gods were always having sex with goddesses and women and all sorts of stuff. And Tajul said, well, the Quran says that um, Muslim men can have four wives, up to four wives. And the feminist said, no, no, that was before. Like, that's not true anymore. That was due to circumstances. So they start getting into this big argument. <laughs> and, and that was kind of funny. Um, anyway, so here's the multicultural democratic society. They pray five times a day. Right toward the end when I was there was um, Ramadan, where they fast all day. And this is, they dress, uh, Usually they pray in their house, but during Ramadan, what they do is they have their final prayer and then they go and have a feast uh, because they eat a big feast before sunrise and then they eat after. So these are the, the little girls waiting for the feast. Um, and this is where I gave, this is where I'm gonna go in September. Um, and I talked about democracy in Greece. I talk about nonviolence, um, civil, demonstrations. I've been in many of them and I encourage them to do it. They have a tradition of student violent demonstrations. And I just say, no, no, that's, it's better to be nonviolent for the same reasons I say it in the US. Um, I talk about Plato's model and they like that. Um, the responsibilities um, I talked to, and they love to do this, and they love to have their picture taken. It's just crazy. And after every lecture, they would they would want to have a picture of me on their Facebook post, right? And so at the beginning of every lecture, I said, okay, afterwards, you can line up, and I'll just be here for as long as everybody gets one because they started pushing each other around like, ah, I don't want her to leave before I get my Facebook. But okay, fine, no problem. Um, anyway, so uh, why should anyone get philosophy, a degree? And I talked about that. And this is where I'm at my house and Ronti is serving. Um, they Unfortunately, they eat a lot of snack food, you know, kind of Western corporation stuff. It's too bad because they have so much healthy food. This was my room over here. And this was Ronti's room and, and the kitchen was back there. Anyway, um, that was fun. Um, okay. They, they were very surprised at how informal I was and that I had invited them to my house and stuff. They wanted to learn English and they knew I had, I have a kind of accent, the Midwest accent that's the most enviable. Um, okay, so I, they were trying to imitate the US. Oh, the great democracy, we have to be like that. And I said, no, no, 
you know, don't do that. Become the best Indonesia you can become. Um, and this one was about um, intercultural stuff, um, about uniting reason and science and religion. That was really big in Indonesia. Um, history of the West, education, um, educational system. And you should, you know, you know, it's, I have a different way of educating. Um, all right, so let's see. There's a equality, you can tell, male and female equality. And even the administrators, there were a lot of women administrators. This is where I went to a high school with uh, kids from farms, poorer kids come to this school and they live there and they grow their own food and they grow honey and all sorts of goods to sell. And that's how they, they are self-sustaining economically. Um, and it was a former Hindu uh, town. And so they have this influence of Hinduism. Um, the girls and the boys sit at opposite sides of the room. And they had this, you know, celebration for me. I was like the big, the huge <laughs> famous visitor from the U.S. You know, I don't know if anyone from the U.S. had ever come to that town. So that was cool. Okay, this was the terrorism. So that paper that I wrote about um, applying Aristotle's theory to terrorism. All right. So here, this story is that here's me presenting. And I presented in the morning. And then in the afternoon, at lunchtime, we we're eating lunch. And this van pulled up with these guys, a bunch of people in white. And my colleagues go, oh my God, you know, they're here. And I was like, what is this? And then he gave this talk. Um, and it was all about how Muhammad is the only one. He's the seal of the prophets. He's the only one worth following because he knows how to handle anger and he knows how to handle self-control. And I'm feeling, you know, hey, buddy, if you'd come to my talk in the morning, you'd know why that ain't so. And he was, and then afterwards, he was speaking English and, and he asked for questions. I had like a list of eight questions. I just hammered that guy. I just, I went straight after him. And everybody in the audience, like these other Indonesians, are just going, oh, good, good for you. Um, and it turns out that this is a very radical extremist uh, group who really wants, you know, a much more intolerant view of Islam. And, it also, and they come from the Mideast, and they're trying to recruit college students. And this guy grew up in Southern California. And here he is, you know, an American, and he's on this mission to make the world Muslim because he knows how degenerate America is. But he's just destroying the culture of the Indonesians, right? He has no respect. Oh, I just really despise that guy. But I was so happy that I had enough status in that conference to be able to sit there and hammer him. That was great. Um, this one is about feminism. I'm supposed to talk about feminism the night before, you know, this guy, well, why don't you talk about that? I was like, okay, whatever. And then they have batik. I used to sew. And I, so it was like an artistic thing. And I really like that people do not live by bread alone, that they, they use their, their furniture, their dishware, you know, the, the daily things they have are crafted and they tell stories and they they integrate culture and nature and they don't, you know, we are cultural beings. We aren't just people that sort of eat out of a trough or something, right? We need to link our physical needs with culture. And so Batik was big and they couldn't pay me money for coming, but I, I told, they asked me, well, what can we get you? I said, well, you can get Batik because I love it. And so there they are. They just piled me high with the stuff. And that was nice. Um, let's see. Oh, these are all the different places that I went. 
Then there was the art, the stuff about corruption. Oh, here. Okay, so here's the funny part. Is that we're driving down the street and I look at the sign and it says they're selling Martabach. And I was like, what? <laughs> That's my name. You know, Martha Beck. Like Martabach? And it's sort of like you go to 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 Paris or or you come from Paris to the US and somebody is selling omelette, you know, it's like, huh? <laughs> and um, somebody's name is omelette and you go to France and gee, they're, they're selling me. But anyway, that's the way it was. So there was McDonald's Martabach, there was sweet Martabach, there was uh, meat Martabach, whatever. Um, and this one was learning how, trying to sit cross-legged, which I was completely unable to do. This one was, I got a Hindu sword, an authentic Hindu sword. <laughs> I still, I have it in my living room. And my, my grandchildren, when I showed them my Hindu sword, they were pretty impressed. Um, then the food they eat with their fingers. And boy, that took some practice. The first time I did it, oh my God, my lap was all full of junk. And when I stood up, it oh god, that was bad. But anyway, so there they are. They take a little bit of rice and a little bit of meat and a little bit of the spice and some vegetable, and then they put it. And it's much more natural than eating with silverware. Again, eating is a physical thing, so that was fun. And they also are the spice islands, so everything they eat is really hot, and I don't like hot, so that was tough. This is going fishing. And they use, um, and bamboo is kind of like duct tape for them. They use bamboo. They can build a three-story house with bamboo. They can build a bridge with bamboo. They can fix a bridge with bamboo. And they have bamboo shoots. They can put it in soup. They have coconut milk and bamboo soup. That was one of my favorite soups. And then, you know, when you live in a neighborhood, I think we're all fundamentally alike. The moms with their little kids get together on Saturday morning and chit chat, chit chat. And what they want is a middle class. That's all they want, right? They want to feel secure, have a house and food, clothing, shelter. And the trouble is the way the international system is set up, it's getting much harder to do that. Money is sticking to money and climate change and all that. But anyway, I mean, it's just intuitively obvious. This is where the Dutch, uh, broke treaties. They made treaties, they broke them twice, but now they're coming back and trying to help Indonesia develop. Then I went to a wedding and there was, we waited a long time. And um, finally, you know, Tajul said, oh, it's time to eat. And I said, do you mean you eat before the wedding? And he said, oh, they already had the wedding. It was in a tent because only men can be at the wedding. It's like, All right. Um, and so I got my picture taken with the bride and groom. Um, and then we went to eat something and I'm, I'm a vegetarian. So most of it was meat. So there was this green bean salad. I decided, okay, I'm just going to pile it up. So I look like I'm, I'm eating their food. And I took a bite of it and it was, hot peppers. <laughs> so uh, Ronti noticed what I did and she gave me a banana, she gave me a tangerine, she went and got some water for me, but that was pretty funny. These are puppets and in, in plays, they have little puppet plays. And that's the guy that says what other people won't say, you know, like the fool in Shakespeare or Socrates. Uh, this is the batik and this is the international they have a Hindu temple and then a Muslim mosque was built in it, but they have this incredible interfaith culture and it's a matter of helping, helping it to survive and set a model for other societies to say that if you want a democracy, you have to have religious toleration. And that's becoming a, even a bigger issue now, right? Politicians are using religion as a weapon. And so, these are the threats to maintaining democracy, a takeover by the military, a takeover by the rich, uh, that the majority are distracted and apathetic and they don't know how to vote. They, they're uninformed. 
and then there's this decline and then this really powerful uh, power hungry person or group from the left or from the right but in, in a communist in a country near communist revolutions the left wing is communist and they will take over so the punchline is is that we should hope that Indonesia manages to preserve its democracy and it is under threat uh, more than when I was there. Um, does anybody have a reaction to that? Anybody want to make a comment? Because if not, I'll move on, but just raise your hand. Okay. Um, all right, so let's see. Um, where are we? Ugh. Okay, so here's um, the Buddhism in Indonesia, the pretty pictures. Um, this is a, one of the world's most famous Buddhist temples, and this is also in the town where I'm going to be. Um, so there's the Buddha, the narrative of his life. And I, I showed you some pictures of that. The natural setting is gorgeous. <clears throat> and there's my colleague, uh, Jarut. He's the one I'm going to have contact with in September. And this one, my other favorite, he died suddenly of a heart attack. So life is short. We have to keep doing our thing. Um, and then I went to the coral reefs in Bunaken and, and snorkeled, and that was gorgeous. So this is what it's like. Um, and there were some kids. They have a German dad and an Indonesian mom. And that was dinner. And then this kid has a crab. So um, that was fun uh, to see that. Stop the share. Okay. Oh, dear. Then I had, oh, geez, sorry. Okay, so then I had, ugh, this drives me nuts. Okay, um, this stuff gets in the way. All right, then I had uh, this article about religion. And I asked you to read the first article about holistic education that uh, Islam is consistent with a holistic education. So I do want you to comment on that. And I did want you to read that. So I'll ask you about that. Um, then I had the Indonesian students. What I commented on in the pre-class video was that they're applying to study public policy in the US. And the US has more public policy programs than anywhere. And yet Americans themselves have no interest in public policy. And they are terrible at figuring out about deliberation, learning about good governance, uh, is participatory collaborative networking. So all these Indonesian kids are coming here to learn this stuff. And Americans are the opposite. They're ideological and they're polarized. And so, you know, we're going to lose our democracy while they're, you know, they're gaining in terms of having leaders that are democratic and that are rewarded for being deliberative. And we're losing, right? People keep voting for polarizing politicians. Um, anyway, so. So his goal is to clean up the corruption. And um, so that was fun. And I did want you to just, just scroll through it to give you a sense of what's going on in the world. Um, so that's, that's that one. Then this one I told you I would ask you about. It's four different editorials about the tsunami. And the one is, where was God? You know, oh, we shouldn't question God. God has a plan. And the second one was, well, we, sh we could have prevented this. If Americans had paid 25 cents more, 
we could have this whole global uh, tools, technology to measure earthquakes and get people out of the way before that tsunami hits. Um, and then this one was, we actually did prepare and we prevented waterborne diseases because the World Health Organization, like we planned ahead and we used our science and our, um, our knowledge to prevent, to solve a possible problem. And this one was that we are stingy. You know, it confirms that we're stingy. Americans give 15 cents per person in official development assistance to poor countries. Really? Um, actually, my daughter and son-in-law work at the Department of Labor under um, International Economic Development Projects. So this is some of the 15 cents there. Um, Okay, so then we increased it by one fifth, right? So that would be like 18 cents uh, during the Bush administration. Um, it's just our, as a share of our economy, our contribution left us ranking last among 22 top donor countries, among the developed countries. Um, so that's just to give you some perspective on who we are. Then this one was the one I said I'd ask you about. Okay, it gives you 12 different ways of trying to make sense of the tsunami. And I want you to tell me, I'll read them, and you tell me which one you like, or which combination you like, or if you have another alternative. Do you think, what do you think people should be thinking? Well, it's God's way of controlling overpopulation, or people died innocently, so they'll go to heaven uh, if they're Christians and they don't have other sins. So we should rejoice for their eternal happiness. Um, so, or people died innocently um, if they haven't been exposed to Christianity and they haven't rejected it, then they'll go to heaven, and that's great. People who died innocently will go to heaven. People who gave aid to help will get rewarded. So this tsunami provides an opportunity for souls to be saved. Um, God created a world where tidal waves exist, but there's no necessity for people to be living where they would be killed. Um, the death was an accident. It wasn't God's will. And God's not going to change the natural world because we happen to live in places where there are tsunamis. We don't need to do anything. This is, we don't need to do anything because it was just an accident. Okay, God created a world where these things happen, um, but Christians have a moral obligation to help. Okay, then there's, there is no God. Accidents happen. We don't have to do anything. There's no God, but we know the world is overpopulated and this will help. There's no God, but the purpose of life is to help our fellow creatures, right? This would be atheist humanism. We should give because it's humane. Um, there is no God. The mind is capable of generosity and also devising machines to measure change and to prevent future disasters. That's what we should be doing. Generosity and technology to prevent it. Okay, God created the natural world and created us as rational creatures. Faith tells us we, th we should empathize and use our reason to improve the human condition uh, for the glory of God, okay? Then whichever view you take, if you identify with being Christian, you will ha you'll have other self-identified Christians who disagree with you, and you'll have other self-identified atheist humanists who agree with you, right? Okay, so I want you to clock in and say which one makes the most sense to you or which combination. All right, um, who wants to start? Uh, I'll go um, ahead. Okay, Zane, go ahead. Um, the one that I like and kind of how I feel about it is number six where it said, um, God created a world where there is tidal waves and, you know, all these natural disasters where it happened, but it wasn't in his will, you know, to set this up to destroy humans, you know, kind of be vengeful in a way. And us as Christians, we're supposed to go out and help. And uh, that's just kind of 
I found that one as kind of uh, peaceful, but also it's one that um, it's kind of like what I believe. And I mean, I know every, not every Christian def, or doesn't believe that way, but that's just kind of how I interpret the Bible and how I see life sometimes. Good. Well, that's the point of the class, right? You figure out who else wants to. I'll end up calling on you. So who wants to go next? Anybody? I can. Okay. So I agree with him with the sixth one saying that God has created the earth, but he does not personally create the tidal waves. I think that he, my viewpoint on it is that he created earth and he can cause some things to happen, but I don't think he personally goes out and creates tidal waves to kill people. Okay. I, I think, think there's another one thing that happened because of how the earth was created. Right. And I have one where it says generosity helping. And then another one says generosity plus science to prevent, right? Mm -hmm. I think I think that was farther down the list. So which one would you say? I would think the science one. The one that has generosity now and then science to prevent the future. Yeah. Okay. Um, who else? Ryan? Um, I'm reading through it and I feel like it's a, for me, it's a combination of both, but not fully the whole thing. Like, right. for example, like, um, I think probably, I think it was, it was four. Oh, wait. Kind of number three, kind of people died, but really not innocently because everybody sins. Um, okay. there's no other sins, I believe we all sin, but as long as you repent, then God will be able to forgive you if it's genuine. Um, and people who didn't outright reject Christianity or reject God, that I feel like is a different category. Like if you just didn't know about God, then you can't really be damned to hell because you didn't make that choice of whether you're rejecting God or not. Okay. And um, I believe that children will go to heaven. Um, and then we should rejoice, not really that they died, but that they're in a better place, or at least, um, you know, that's the best thing we can do as humans, right? Because we can't keep mourning something that we have no control over. At one point, we have to just accept what is and and just try and think of a positive within the negative. So I think it's kind of like that. Okay. Um, Tim. Mm -hmm. And so what I found interesting was, um, let me find it. Um, one where it said God created a world where earthquakes and tidal waves happened. The extents of people where they would be killed was not God's will, but Christians have more obligation to help. I feel like they're saying like he's I feel like they're just interpreting it as like God's throwing you obstacles to see like to weed out the strong and stuff like that. Because if he said um, that it wasn't God's will. So it wasn't his will to really kill nobody from the earthquake. I believe it was just a test to see like who's strong and whose families could really last strong enough with um with the earthquake coming, like who can really bond together. That's what mm -hmm. I think though. Okay, that's number six. Mm -hmm. How about um, God created number 11? We should empathize and we should use our reason to improve the condition. In other words, to prevent, uh, so we could have predicted it, right? Yeah. So I don't know, that was what I was asking Alexis. Do you think number six or number 11 or a combination of those two? Kind of a combination, but I'm not too sure on 11. But Okay, I mean, the thing is, with the number six is, yes, you bond together, but you don't do anything to prevent it. You don't use science and technology to prevent what we can prevent, right? Yes. So that would be that God gave us a natural world that's predictable and the ability to use our reason to prevent these disasters. So do you think that that would be part of your world through, or do you just think it happens. Um, okay, so Ryan would say 11. Okay. Um, I mean, you can think about it, Tim. I don't, 
it's just the other one isn't is just more comprehensive yeah. and it accounts for more of those editorials that's all yeah and that goes back to whether religion's main task is resilience because what you're talking about is resilience or if you don't also add using your mind to prevent then it gets to be kind of fatalism um, right we don't try to do anything um okay combination okay colin will say a combination of 10 and 11 okay uh let me go back um and check that out okay 10 is there's no god the mind is capable of generosity and devising machines to measure changes we should develop those machines and um, use them to help others that's the uh, atheist humanist and then this one would be the um, religious humanist position does that make sense colin and you like you're indifferent about whether it have to be an atheist humanist or a religious humanist, as long as there are those two factors that you use your mind to prevent problems and to help people and all that stuff. Does that, is that where you want to go, Colin? Do you have a chat? Did you say something in the chat? Okay, I don't know. Did you hear me? Oh, well, let's just assume that's what Colin meant. Uh, okay, there, okay, there could be a God, but we have the ability to combat the incidents. Yeah, okay, good. Um, that's kind of like Mr. Newland. He decides, well, this view of human flourishing, the biology of the spirit, you can add God or you don't need God, but it's the same main point is that we're designed to enjoy life and to live and to flourish. Um, okay, so who hasn't spoken? Alyssa, what about you? Um, I was, I, I think that was number six that I liked, the one with um, uh, how Christians have to um, respond. Man, I just completely blanked on it, but um, the first one that Zane said. Right. I thought, I thought that one made the most sense, and I don't know if I'm like, talking crazy here but i was thinking of how like we're decidedly not in heaven right now uh and so like that's not god's fault that we're having tsunamis you know uh in a way he can't really like protect us until we go up to heaven so i'm not gonna be like mad at god for a tsunami what about 11 where you combine it with using science to create those machines to prevent to predict earthquakes and get people evacuated from there. Yeah, I guess that one would also um, more so fit with my like view on it. Number 11. Okay, that was that's my main point is that, you know, some people really don't want science, right? They want just bonding and faith. And other people really do, their religion really does require bringing in the sacrifice because God gave us the ability to do that. So I, I think that's an important thing for each of you to kind of work out in your head. Um, all right, so I guess that's enough of that. And then the next thing was, there was an article about Einstein's God, and there was an article about science and religion. Um, and I have these quotes, all right? This is the cosmic religious feeling. It's only three pages of quotes. Um, I assumed that you had the book, but anyway, this is where Zane said, this knowledge of something we can't penetrate, uh, something of the profoundest reason, the most radiant beauty. It's this knowledge and the emotion that constitute the truly religious attitude. In this sense, I'm deeply religious. Uh, it's enough for me, the mystery of life. Um, okay, so there's that. So I'm going to ask you to comment on one of these quotes. So I'll go through um, some of them. I guess I'm running out of time, but 
um, what kind of worldview do you want? And then there's an interview with a theoretical physicist, a couple, and an astrophysicist. We have a natural desire to understand what God was thinking. It's not arrogant, it's natural. And there's a lot we've learned by studying. Um, and, and okay, here's another one I want everyone to react to. Science without religion is lame. And religion without science is blind. Okay, so keep that in mind. Um, nature, okay, Dyson says that nature finds all these extraordinarily complex structures which have their own rules. So nature is this self, self ordering system. And then, you know, the key is is there a God that designed it that way? Or is it literally just it self governs? itself organizes on its own right uh, black holes um okay and then ancient cultures had it, the ancient cultures are more like what they are discovering in quantum mechanics and physics quantum physics and that's why yeah i mean i agree with that um all cultures distinguish between chronological time and eternally eternity um and einstein has a big respect for spiritual the prophets and the spiritual leaders like saint francis and buddha he he understands their genius the religious geniuses are distinguished by this religious feeling and that's the most important function of art and science to awaken this feeling so you know i'd like you to respond to that if you can um davis is the universe is not only beautiful and harmonious and put together it's fit for life eventually human beings evolved uh, the hand of god can work through quantum uncertainties um let's see the universe is about something and we're part of whatever the something is what do you think is the point and then again what would you think humanists blah blah of various stripes so then i'm going to go through these quotes and then i'll ask you so please write down at least one quote from the einstein hopefully two and then um at least one of these so the genesis stories are serious but they're not literal right they're lyrical, they're poetry, and they're supposed to be. And they are educational if you don't take them literally. Okay, then poking horn's big thing is that creation, the way the universe works is that there's this, there's an ordering force and then there's a creative force. The universe is constantly creating, it's changing, it's growing, it's expanding. And that interplay is what leaves room for free will right human beings are we have definite limitations but we also are creating uh god gave us this free will which is the opportunity to create our lives to structure our societies and our lives um let's see uh mathematical beauty we need to listen to the poets uh, because science only explores one aspect of reality, the arts and the sciences need to come together. Um, let's see. If God is the God of truth, we have greater understanding. The more understanding we have, the more we actually learn about God. Prayer is not magic. You can think about what you think prayer is. Um, humans have agency prayer is cooperating with god to bring about the best for the future um our illness is is affected by our personality and our attitude toward our place in the universe um let's see um what i want to get to is he actually talks about tsunamis um the problem of evil okay the world unfolds as the result of genetic mutation, but this also opens the possibilities for cancer, for cells to mutate and become malignant. So um, God created us 
the the vision the, the capacity for seeing is part of the flourishing of the universe but some people are born blind right well that isn't because that's a privation it's just a failure to achieve the natural goal so that's not a deliberate you know evil that our god is going to interfere with the natural order just to punish a person no this one tectonic plates are necessary for a planet that's going to have life right because it, you have to you have to have creativity and the plates change things so that more species can grow and so that you know it changes necessary for developing even more cornucopia of lives and uh the biosphere gets more complicated and better okay the elements clash and they behave according with their nature uh they're allowed to be what they are when people okay so it's not evil right they're just being natural and human beings happen to live where the tsunami hit right it's not anything personal about people they just happen to live there now the other issue is that in california everybody knows there's going to be this huge earthquake i remember being in a museum in san diego and it has this little richter scale and it said within the next 60 years there will be a an earthquake that is a nine point on the richter scale and millions of people will suffer and die. And I was like, why are you living here? <laughs> but, you know, when it happens, oh, where's God? God's will. How come God? Oh, that, that really annoys me. You know, if you choose to live there, you choose to live with the knowledge that you you might get killed by an earthquake. But don't blame God. Like God set it all up for you to know this. And you arrogantly live there anyway. That's testing God, right? That's like standing on the pinnacle and jumping down. And, you know, if God really cares or is all powerful, he'll, he won't let me get hurt or he won't have the earthquake or whatever. I find that very annoying. Um, uh, a God of love and a God that works through natural processes fit, fit together. Okay, so everybody needs to clock in on something. All right, what you got, Ryan? You got something? Um, can you come back to me really quick? I want to look at all the quotes first. Okay. Oh, I go. What? Okay. Go ahead, Tim. Oh, I was I can um, get it over what uh, I got one. Good. For um the Einstein he said um one of them where he said uh, even though we're not the center of the universe. We have emerged and we can truly feel part of nature in cosmic sense. So like obviously we only know about our planet most likely and not really the other ones and everything about space. But we do know as our sort of civilization has emerged so so well, especially with the technology we have now, we've only become even smarter from the, the days from back then. So I mean, I feel like that kind of helps a lot when it comes to like advancement of um society and then the other uh quote you wanted us to talk about i saw like one of the first ones that kind of struck me was where it said god created a world with independence a word about to make itself creation is out is an ongoing act but that's true because like Obviously, we all and our, like, usually will be like independent and stuff like that. But once you like start merging out and try to find new things and what works and what doesn't, and that's how um, um, societies are made, especially back then where they didn't really have a lot of stuff. They had to go out like, on an ongoing quest to find stuff to help their civilization better off when they get back. Innovation, right? Yep. And then, um, so you do think that when we study and understand the universe, we're studying God, is that right? Or honoring yeah. God? Yeah. Okay. 
and we're doing what God would want us to do. Like, yeah, I gave you reason. I gave you something to know. Like, huh? <laughs> You're not going to use it? What? Um, okay, Alyssa, what have you got? Um, with the first quote, uh, the like, uh, science without religion is lame and stuff. But that one, that one makes a lot of sense because I mean, we've seen before where people rely purely on one or the other. And when like people become too focused on science, they tend to forget like the actual human aspect of everything. And then um, when people become too focused on religion, you know, they get lost and it's naive and um, they, they uh, tend to forget about like reality in general. Um, and I cannot remember the other quote that I was going to talk okay. about right now. I'll come back to you. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, Lex Lexi? I'm here. Sorry. I'm, my mind's everywhere. Um, I also wanted to comment on the without science, religion is lame. And without religion, without Science without religion, religion is lame. lame. And religion, religion without science, science is lame. So I have spent my entire life trying to come to terms with that science has been physically proven, but religion is something I have faith in. And I, and then more in my recent years, I've come to terms with the fact that it's not something I can help that I believe in science because I see the proof and struggle to leave religion because I don't see the proof. It's not my fault, but and I've come to terms with I can combine the both because God can't do everything. He can't, he doesn't, as a little child, I used to think that God would like make the bees go each path to each specific flower because he wanted them to go to that flower. But now I know that it's because the bee had sent the pollen from the flower. He wanted to go to that flower. God, I um, also spent a lot of time searching and I know God has limits to himself and what he pri prioritizes. And it took a lot of self-learning, but that was one that like stuck out to me the most. And I completely agree with without, but that religion science is lame because it lacks that like belief factor, that belief it's all facts, it's all proof. But without science, religion is unbelievable because there's nothing there's no like timelines there's no like evidence to it so I think they do coexist perfectly good so you can use that quote or some other quotes from these readings you know for your final worldview if you like yeah. um, and then also I mean every lecture we've had is the union of reason and faith right in some way so mm -hmm. there's a lot of material there if you remember the biology of the spirit that was more biology based and the human psyche um, and how people flourish biologically. Um, and this one is more like you're finding out technology and then helping human beings flourish that way. Um, let's see, what did Colin? Colin said, um, you do find religion without science is blind, right? I like the idea of why things happen, of course. Uh, there can be a God, but we have the ability to, to combat right. There could be a God, but um, yeah, combination of 10 and 11. It doesn't, what really you want to focus on is the way you use your mind to um, help human beings flourish. If somebody wants to be an atheist, if somebody wants to be a Christian, if someone wants to be a Muslim, whatever. <laughs> okay. Um, Jordan, do you have anything? Uh, okay, let's see. Has everybody spoken? I have not. Oh, okay, Zane, go ahead. Um, yeah, uh, kind of going off what Lexi said, I've always been a big believer that uh, science and religion do go hand in hand. I also think without each other, like kind of what it said, religion is blind and science is kind of lame. But um, kind of uh, kind of a funny story. Uh, when I was in like eighth or ninth grade, my football coach, he was actually my science teacher too, but I mean, he was also a really big Christian, but we would have these conversations and stuff of how they both intertwine and it's crazy like how, uh, how like fluent, like fluent, fluent, I guess would be a good way to use it. Like how well they, you know, feed off of each other. So 
I've always been a big believer that those two coexist well. And then also the other quote what I liked was um, it talked about how like God created a universe that's ongoing and changing all the time. And that leaves room for free will for both, you know, the people of the earth and also the divine. And I like that quote pretty good. Okay. Um, all right. So this class has given you a whole lot of, right. You could do Newland, you could do the stress one or the depression one or the uh, revenge one, you know, you can do, there's a lot of different readings that sort of fit together with that. So that's why I like students to, I like all the papers are different, um, as different as possible. Okay, Ryan, back to you. Um, I would say, I mean, I like both, but like we kind of use it multiple times a religion one, I guess. So the second one would be God works through nature as much as anything else. If God is the if God is the God of truth, and the more truth we have, the greater understanding we have, and the more we are actually learning about God. So I think that's really interesting because that's, of course, my worldview of the idea that, like, knowledge is power and that it's important to have knowledge and to keep seeking it because it ultimately helps you learn about yourself and grows your faith when you get more knowledge and more, I guess, challenging thoughts that maybe even opposes your original beliefs. And that only helps to grow your beliefs or even change it, but for the better, because you get to know yourself more. So and you won't be a bigot <laughs> and you won't let anybody use religion as a weapon, right? That's another sign that God would want us to use our reason, because if you don't, people in the name of God are, are torturing people and brutalizing it. That should be pretty obvious that isn't, that wasn't. <laughs> that's not the plan does that make sense okay so um all right we have one more thing here um and and next time you come with your outlines and your ideas and the more articulate you are the more the other students should be able to help you so i am truly going to ask each of you to present and then every one of you has to make a comment to everyone, right? About, would you, this reminds me of this article, would you wanna add that article or just clarify something? So I really want it to be an extended dialogue. We have few enough students, so everybody can get engaged with everyone. Um, this one is about how religion and politics, if you combine them, it's corrupt. Um, all right, didn't have a problem yesterday. Um, let's see, okay. So these were uh, articles that I put together. Oh gosh, it's not, these were newspaper articles because there have been times, here we go. Um, there was a time after 9-11, this was big in the newspaper, It it, you know, it's still big news, but we just don't pay that as much attention to it anymore. Um, any religion can be corrupted by politics and economics. Um, international trade has not led to universal prosperity. So now people are anxious. Um, what's the place of religion in a postmodern world? And then just asking questions about that. Science and religion in a postmodern world. So these are these are newspaper articles. Uh, what is the life of the spirit? Um, religion, is it inherently conservative or inherently progressive? And I've said that every one of those iconic leaders rejected the status quo. They were progressive, they were critical, but and they weren't conservative in the sense of embracing the tradition, they were not the status quo, they questioned, but they were conservative in the values of self-control and courage and generosity, but that doesn't mean progressives are not self-controlled, right? And generous and um, anyway. So this is a religious awakening after 9-11, right? Pat Robertson, um, that this town is more likely to suffer natural disasters because the citizens rejected the teaching of intelligent design. 
these are claims he's made as a preacher with some kind of hotline to God, right? He wants the assassination of Chavez. He says that stuff about feminism. Um, and then there was a official in the face based initiatives program in the Bush administration who said when he meets together with people about how to get some programs going, they ridicule the evangelicals, but then they use this political rhetoric while um, manipulating them to vote for Bush and Republicans. Um, but they're cynical, right? They don't agree with these people. Um, Bush claimed it was non-political, but that's not true. The staff are cynically manipulating people. Um, then Matthew Dowd was a political operative. Actually, he gets interviewed on these shows that I watch. Um, he switched parties because he had originally worked for Bush, but he did get fed up with them because Bush didn't require shared sacrifice after 9-11. He ignored the will of the people about Iraq. Nobody's accountable for our, our torture program. Um, he has a my way or the highway mentality. And um, so Mr. Dowd actually believed, right, that, that Bush was the better candidate and he just changed his mind. And that's hard to do. He likes Bush personally, but not his policies. He says it's like falling in love, but you're blind to the problems and you ignore, you know, all this other stuff. Um, so he did a lot to help Rove uh, to exploit divisions with people. Like he was a polarizing advisor. He advised them about how to polarize and how to get Southerners to vote Republican because he's a Texan. But he regretted that, right? Um, and now he is a Democrat. He ran for governor of Texas. He, he threw his candidacy in the race. I think it was governor. But he's kind of removed it now because it didn't get enough traction. Um, but I can't remember exactly what, what that trajectory was. This one is by a scholar. A, nature, a nation of Christians is not a Christian nation, right? Our founders did not want an established religion, as I've said before. But this is just, uh, this is an outline of the, um, the founders and the way they thought. And then the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, King was not a Republican or a Democrat, right? He's focused on, he's very conservative in getting the founders back to their first principles. And then Russia is returning to religion and using religion to justify authoritarianism. Um, China is going back to um, uh, Buddhism and Confucianism, but is hiding right behind that is um, authoritarianism, which has gotten a lot worse since, since these articles. Um, so um, yeah, and then the Pakistan test is about, again, um, extremists and how to deal with extremists. And the president of Pakistan is pandering to extremists, Tibet, India, there's this big bombing in Mumbai. And, and so extremists are uh, polarizing India. And now India has Muti, a very polarizing candidate. And he's, what he does is he appeals to the Hindus who are the vast majority and he trashes the Muslims, right? And this is partly why, right, the bombing. And so there's a lot of religious animosity and religious um, war um, going on in India also. So, so you are stepping into history at this certain point where all of these are really big problems, climate change, big problem, uh, religion as tied to reason or not tied to reason, um, uh, religion being used as a political weapon. All this stuff is going to affect your life. It already affects your life a lot because it affects our tax structure, who gets taxed. It affects where money goes, funding, 
more police, more military, less education, less healthcare, or more deficits for you to inherit. So you are profoundly affected by it. You just probably don't. I mean, it's normal, right? You don't know anything else. So I do think you ought to kind of be aware and then think about where the direction you want to take the country. Because even if you don't have a lot of power, you're going to have an opinion about the direction that the country is going. And you say, well, that's generally the direction I want to go. Or no, I don't want to go that way. I want to, okay, so it's just like you have this big ship and it matters a lot which direction because after over time, it makes a big difference. So what might look like a little difference is not a little difference. Um, just, you know, passing one, a couple laws can have these huge ramifications. So that's it. And tomorrow, I do want you to have your outlines and you will get graded on your presentations and you get graded on whether you ask good questions and stay engaged in the class. And um, yeah, I have four, three or four posts to read on Hinduism and Confucianism. I hope to have that done tomorrow afternoon. Um, and I'll, you can go, but I'll stay here if anybody has questions. So bye-bye. I'll see you. Okay, Jordan, do you have a question or Lexi? No. Um, oh, I got to stop the recording.